Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Ophthalmology Podcast, brought to you by Mayo Clinic. I'm your host, Dr. Andrea Tooley. And I'm Dr. Eric Bothan. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest in ophthalmology, medicine, and more. In today's episode, we are joined by two clinician scientists, Drs. John Chen and Arthur Sitt. Dr. Chen, a neuro-ophthalmologist, and Dr. Sitt, a glaucoma specialist, combine their interest in optic neuropathies and their backgrounds in biomechanics to study glaucoma, papilledema, and more. Dr. John Chen, MD and PhD, is the professor of ophthalmology and neurology here at the Mayo Clinic. He is internationally recognized for his work with optic neuropathy, and we have hosted him and featured him in our program here at the podcast, previously discussing optic neuritis and papilledema. Dr. Arthur Sitt is a professor of ophthalmology at the Mayo Clinic, and he is our research chair for the Department of Ophthalmology. Together, Dr. John Chen and Arthur Sitt were recently awarded an R01 for their work involving the biomechanics of the eye in glaucoma and papilledema. Welcome, Dr. Sitt and Dr. Chen. Thank you very much. It's just a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. We're so excited to have both of you here to talk about your collective research together. I think that's pretty unique to have a research team here together for the podcast. So first of all, congratulations on your R01. That's really exciting news. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. We want to talk about um, how your research bridges both glaucoma and neuro-ophthalmology, because those are to- to- two totally different specialties. So to start, um, let's talk about ocular biomechanics. I know, Dr. Say, you have a mechanical engineering background from MIT. So you're an engineer kind of at the heart of everything. How did you guys bridge this together? And really, what is ocular biomechanics? That's, that's a great question, and I'll, I'll start off by saying that I'm not going to put up any equations for, for you to look Please at today. <laughs> so, um, so first of all, I do have to acknowledge our, our collaborator on this, uh, Dr. Xiaoming Zhang, who is a PhD in the Department of Radiology, and, and this is really a collaborative project in the best, in the best spirit of, of Mayo Clinic. Um, and um, and uh, we've developed a technology uh, called uh, ultrasound vibroelastography. I'll get, that to, get to that in a little bit. But first of all, in terms of what is ocular biomechanics, that's really just to look at the structures of the eye and how strong the tissues are and how does it support pressure, because the eye is, is a pressure vessel and the eye really is meant to allow us to see and to do that, it has to hold a pressure so that the tissues are in a constant shape. But the eyes act on, acted upon by a lot of different forces, the forces inside the eye from the pressure within the eye, the intraocular pressure, but also behind the eye, um, the eye is connected to the brain, so we have the, the, the intracranial pressure acting on it, and then we also have muscles pulling on it, we have blood vessels connected, uh, and veins, and so there's a lot of different forces acting on the eye. So ocular biomechanics is to try to understand uh, the tissue properties and how well those tissues can support all those forces that are acting upon it and preserve healthy vision. John, you're such a true neuro-ophthalmologist because as soon as Arthur said it, the eyes connected to the brain, you immediately had this big smile on your face. It was so perfect. I just had to point that out. You're like, yes, the brain. I love it. No, that's a great explanation, but very complex. It, it is. Uh, you know, ocular biomechanics is, is a very complex issue because the eye is, is um, as we all know here, is made up of different tissues. Uh, there's different parts of the eye, and again, with all these different connections to the eye, um, there's, there's, it's a very complex organ, and, and it's also a very delicate organ, so um, it's difficult to measure ocular biomechanics. So, you know, in some other parts of the body, skin, for example, if you wanted to measure its properties, you might just take a skin biopsy. We can't do that in the eye, so we need to find ways to measure it non-invasively, and that's really what our project, our, our research, Uh, leading up to this grant has been focused on developing that core technology. Okay. So we're measuring the stiffness of the eye, essentially. Exactly. And why is that important in either glaucoma or optic neuropathies? Why does that even matter? So so I'll start with glaucoma, and then and then and John will can explain papilledema far better than I could. So with glaucoma, glaucoma is a, an optic neuropathy uh, where um, there's a characteristic change in the appearance of the optic nerve, and and the key factor is is intraocular pressure, and so there's something about the pressure in the eye that uh, uh, combined with all the other forces that act on the eye that 
that cause some patients to, to lose um, nerve cells, retinal ganglion cells, and, and eventually lose vision, and, and some patients even go blind. So uh, one of the, one of the uh, puzzling things, though, is that um, intraocular pressure is what we treat in glaucoma, so we lower the pressure to try to prevent further damage. But most patients who have high pressure never get glaucoma, and a lot of patients, probably up to half of patients, have glaucoma with, in what we would consider a normal range of pressure. So, so we think that, that it's, it's more than just pressure. It's, it's about whether the tissues in the eye are strong enough to support the pressure that you actually have. Okay. And then from a papilledema standpoint, it's interesting. So Arthur gets glaucoma, and as an ophthalmologist, I get all the other optic neuropathies. <laughs> so it's way better to be an ophthalmologist. <laughs> But in terms of papilledema, essentially papilledema is a swollen optic nerve from raised intracranial pressure. And just like Arthur said, with glaucoma, you can have varying amounts of eye pressure and still get the um, glaucoma. With papilledema, you can have some patients who have, you know, just mildly elevated intracranial pressure and they've got a good amount of papilledema. And some that actually have elevated opening pressures, elevated intracranial pressure, and they don't have papilledema. And ultimately, we think it all boils down to the biomechanics of the eye. And then our, really our goal is to try and predict um, why some patients develop papilledema, one don't. Um, are there some protective features in the eye that might either predispose or prevent papilledema development? Hmm. So how do you measure this? I mean, obviously in ophthalmology, we have different diseases that we're a little bit becoming more and more used to being sensitive to, for instance, keratoconus and the cornea. But you're talking about the globe itself and structures way in the back that you can't just push on like a tonal pen or like other abnormal or conditions where you might blow a puff of air and see the cornea vibrate. Share with us, how do you measure rigidity of the eye in different locations, especially in the back of the eye near the optic nerve in which you guys are most interested? Absolutely, and that, that really gets to the core of the, of the, uh, of the technique, the technology that we're, we're developing. Um, and uh, so essentially what, what, what we do is we can uh, cause a small vibration uh, with a mechanical shaker at, at, the, uh, at the front of the eye. So uh, through closed eyelids, we put the shaker uh, on, this, on the eye and it causes a small vibration. That vibration uh, propagates through the eye. So it actually propagates, um, starts at the cornea, then propagates to the sclera and eventually makes it back to the optic nerve. And using ultrasound, uh, we can uh, visualize that, that wave propagation and by visualizing that wave propagation, we can then look at uh, how fast that wave propagates. And the speed at which that wave propagates is actually related to uh, more traditional measures of, of, of tissue mechanics, uh, like, like the modulus of elasticity. Um, and so that's really what we're trying to get at. By looking at this wave propagation, the speed of the propagation in different tissues, we can then infer um, more conventional measures of, of, uh, of uh, tissue biomechanics. And this is, is this independent of age or other patient-related factors? Because I would think that potentially age would be something that, uh, that would obviously play a role in this, either the vitreous changes or the scleral rigidity changes, but it's not. No, no, that's a great question. And, and, and it, it definitely does change with a number of different factors, age. Um, there, there's uh, um, work that predates us that shows that the, 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 the tissues of the eye do become stiffer with age. Uh, it changes with pressure, which is um, a confounding factor, so mm -hmm. it's, it becomes very complex. Um, That's a chicken or egg situation. Yeah, exactly, and then um, and then things like um, myopia, there, there's some evidence that it changes with that. So really a very complex situation. So um, 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 in our R01, we've tried to focus down on something that's going to give us the most information. And so from the glaucoma side, we're focusing on normal tension glaucoma patients. So those are patients who get glaucoma without having raised intraocular pressure. And we're looking at them before they've had any treatment with medications, which can also change the ocular biomechanics. It's interesting. You, I like analogies. It's almost like you're creating... In, in orbital earthquake and watching the ripple effects because truly in that most of us are well aware of the prediction and understanding that we have measuring when the earth trembles in this case you're creating an orbital you know uh, echo wave and studying it how and appreciating how tissues will respond differently in different conditions 
What was the thought or how did you strategically package both of these into an R01? Yeah, it's it's actually very interesting. So you've got papillodema on one end, you've got glaucoma on the other. Completely, they seem completely totally different. Different. Yeah. Um, different demographics. Glaucoma is elderly patients. Patients with papillodema are typically young females that are obese. But it's actually sort of like two two um, ends of a coin. You know, it all boils down to something called the translaminar gradient. So in the eye, it's connected to the brain, and then they're right there at the optic nerve. If you've got a high eye pressure. There's something called the, um, the lamina cribosa, and if you've got a high eye pressure, the, eye, the pressure actually causes a backbone of the lamina cribosa and potentially stretching and damaging the apic nerves. And then you've got a high pressure in the brain, you've got an upturning of that lamina cribosa, and you get the papillodemas, and then there's a lot of stretch of those optic nerves. So it all boils down to this translimiter gradient, the difference between the eye pressure in the eye and the pressure in the brain. And that differential is potentially what contributes to these optic neuropathies. And so that's how we kind of package these together to see how did the biomechanics of the eye actually influence the changes to eye pressure and changes to pressures in the brain. So is the rigidity of the lamina cribosa where it all meets? Because is a stiffer lamina better or a more or a floppier lamina is that is that what we're finding that is an amazing question so that really the the holy grail is really <laughs> measuring that lamina cabosa yeah the drawback is it's such a small structure we can't measure it with the ultrasound so essentially what we're doing is we're measuring the posterior sclera right adjacent to it with a potential assumption that it may mimic what's going on in lamina cabosa or alternatively it may not but we're actually measuring the posterior sclera kind of in the area of the macula, mm -hmm. but we actually can't measure that optic nerve, lamina cabosa itself. It's just too small with our technology we have right now. And then in terms of your preliminary data, you're, I would think that either stiff lamina or more floppy, well, I don't know what the better term is, <laughs> looser lamina is, is either more pathologic or less, but you're finding the opposite, that in one condition it's good to have a stiffer lamina, and then in the other, in glaucoma, it's better to not, is that right? Uh, so, so not necessarily. I think you're talking, um, probably getting to some of the uh, preliminary data that we presented uh, or published. Um, so it's, it's, again, very complex because mm -hmm. um, if you have a stiff sclera, for example, um, you could actually concentrate deformation into the lima. Uh, the converse might be true where if you have a stiff sclera, if you, if you, you might have larger pressure fluctuations. Mm. So it's, 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 a, it's a very complex issue that we're really just trying to, we're really starting to, to try to understand. Uh, but we did have some um, work in a previous study where we um, used this technique to look at the properties of the cornea, and we didn't find any difference in the corneal properties in glaucoma patients versus normal patients, but we did find something, a difference in something called ocular rigidity, which is an older measure of ocular biomechanics and essentially looks at the change in uh, pressure for a given volume change for the whole eye. So we can't mm -hmm. isolate where it happens, but for the whole eye, uh, glaucoma patients seem to have a lower ocular rigidity, so a more compliant eye. Okay. So that's for the whole eye in terms of ocular rigidity. And what are you finding now with your ultrasound um, looking at posterior sclera in those glaucoma patients? Well, we're very early, so, okay. so we, we don't have um, results that we can present yet. So. This is fascinating to it me. Is. It's remarkable. I, you think about other uses and other conditions that you know, might shed light on this. And I just, you know, in your thought process, you're, we're going to learn about the way it sounds going forward, the glaucoma cohort and the papillodematous cohort. What other conditions might this open us up to treating or understanding? I, I think there's a lot of diseases in the eye that depend on biomechanics. You know, one that kind of relates to papillodema is, is choroidal folds. So in addition, when patients have raised intracranial pressure, their optic nerve swell up. But in addition, sometimes their, their posterior sclera will get push forward, they've got a hyperoptic shift, then you'll get these kind of curves in the in, in the posterior sclera, at coronal folds, and of, of course we think that biomechanics is going to play a role there. If it's softer, maybe it's going to be more compliant there and you get more folds. And then outside of raised intracranial pressure, other diseases as well are probably going to be dependent on it, like myopic degeneration, 
you know, perhaps if you've got a softer eye, might predispose patients to more myopic generation and that kind of elongation of the eye. Mm-hmm. And obviously there's this, you know, huge shift toward higher myopia around the world. And really the ocular mechanics of the eye may be that predisposing factor. And then other things, even the cornea with keratoconus, cross-linking treatments, all those things are all dependent on ocular biomechanics. And I think ultrasound elastography has a large role in trying to understand these diseases and trying to predict which patients are more predisposed to some of these diseases. So in you know, thinking long term, in addition to identifying which ones might have a harder course, are there thoughts or hopes that this would lead to treatment changes or new options in our paradigm? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. Certainly in terms of knowing which patients are good, viable options for treatment, and also I think following treatment effects, I think would be helpful as well. You know, did that cross link truly kind of stabilize that cornea? Um, so I think it can help monitor treatments. In terms of papilledema, our um, preliminary data showed that eyes were actually stiffer that had papilledema. Again, not entirely sure if that's because, as Arthur said, the posterior is sclera stiff, so it doesn't allow that flexibility, all that pressure is getting transmitted to lamina carbosa and papilledema. Or are we actually measuring kind of pressure getting transmitted to that um, back of the eye and causing stiffening? And then using ultrasound elastography, we can see, we can actually determine if which one that is by getting the baseline, treating the papilledema, making mm-hmm. it go away, and seeing if that changes. Mm-hmm. So again, ultrasound elastography can be used to help monitor treatments, monitor response. Scleral windows, things I'm just thinking about rigidity. There are surgical techniques in the past that have been used to change the scleral permeability. Any thought that they would give new life, learning more about the scleral rigidity in these sort of technologies? I think that's a great question. And, um, you know, for glaucoma, as we all know, there's there's a lot of patients who, uh, despite our best efforts, continue to have disease progression. Um, and, and, and that may be just fundamental uh, to their their eyes and their tissue properties. They just may have tissues that are unable to support the pressures that we're able to um, achieve without uh, extreme measures. Um, so, you know, we can certainly think that if, you know, if, if, a, if we need to stiffen the tissues to better support that, then maybe we can do something, uh, you know, probably not cross-linking as we know, it, but there may be a way of stiffening those tissues to better support the pressure. And then uh, on the flip side, if it turns out that we need a more compliant eye that better absorbs pressure fluctuations, then maybe there's ways of, of decreasing that ocular rigidity. Uh, but you know, it's a great question, and, and uh, you know, it's, I think, I think um, it's definitely an area that we want to look, for, look into as we continue our research. As somebody who does optic nerve sheath fenestrations, I kind of thought the same question. I wonder if having fenestrated the nerve, even though it's not affecting the actual eye, would have any kind of relation in, in those pressure mechanics that we're measuring. I think certainly it could. You know, the whole idea behind optic nerve sheath fenestrations is just to create that window, allow that fluid to drain out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, perhaps that's preventing some of that pressure getting to the eye. And then, obviously, its effect on the back of the eye, whether it's it's less stiffening, mm-hmm. I, I think it's it's probably having a role. So I think we should definitely investigate those eyes that are undergoing optic nerve suspension, get a baseline ultrasound elastography, do the surgery, and then do it again mm-hmm. two weeks later and yeah, check absolutely. for the change. See how it changes absolutely. the rigidity. That's very interesting. I know historically people used to go in and sort of try to cut the cuff in some way and it, for different conditions. is. I know fenestrations are back mm-hmm. in the nerve. Are there any procedures done to date that would affect the rigidity of the laminal cuff itself? Yeah, I think you're talking about radial optic neuroti- mm-hmm. neurotomies and... Um, Sounds terrifying. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, the, the clinical results from those were, were never Poor. very good. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm glad they're not being done anymore uh, because, you know, certainly from a glaucoma standpoint, I can just see that weakening the lamina and, and exposing the lamina to even greater deformations. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, um, yeah, I, I think... Unlikely, but it certainly fits. I'm just thinking about other surgical things that are done in that area that would change with your, your measurement tool. 
What I love is that this is such a relatively early field in terms of research that the questions are endless mm -hmm. and there's so many different potential avenues. And I love the collaboration because it's applicable to so many different areas within ocular pathology, which I think is tremendous about your research and at least someone who's more junior entering sometimes you think all the questions have been answered all the data has been collected it's hard to think of something new that hasn't really been investigated and that's exactly what you've done can you t maybe talk to some of the younger ophthalmologists out there who have research questions or how you stumbled upon a collaborative effort or, or what your advice would be to those interested in in asking those big questions I'm sure I, I can start, and, and um, I, I think that uh, again, um, um, being open to those those interesting questions is, is first and foremost the the, the key thing. Um, and then, uh, uh, so I can actually tell you how our collaboration started. Yeah, tell it us. It was um, it was through one of Mayo's um, internal research conferences where people came and put up posters who who had uh, some internal funding through Mayo. Um, and so I was one of those participants, and uh, Dr. Zhang was also one of those participants. So I was just walking around through looking at the different posters, and I saw his poster where he was uh, originally using this, to, this technology to measure much larger, larger organs like liver and skin. Um, but then I said, have you used that in the eye? And that was um, over 10 years ago. So wow. you know, it's, it's, uh, it's been a very interesting process. So definitely keep, keep, an, keep an open mind, um, look for those interesting questions, but also look for opportunities to collaborate because people want to collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and, and uh, work on things that you're interested in. I, I think that's key. If, if, you're never, if you're working on something that, uh, that someone else told you to work on but you're not interested in, that's never gonna work out well. Find something that you're interested in. No, I agree completely. It's it's all about collaborations, and we only have so much time in the day. I don't think any of my research projects are ever just me doing the research. It's really um, kind of finding other people's, you, you, kind of collaborating with their expertise, and it, it makes for a better project, and it actually makes it more fun, too, to you know get a chance to go to conferences with your, your colleagues and kind of build these research projects together. That's great advice. It's exciting. It's, you know, it's in the spirit of academic medicine that we're sharing, cross-pollinating, you know, working together for you know the common goal and advancing what we we're able to do for patients and the whole spirit of this podcast, just bringing voices to the table, sharing, encouraging, and enlightening each other in our practices and patient care. So I thank you both for being here and for sharing your insight uh, and your vision regarding this, your, your grant in your R01, but also this new technology to measure our eyes in a special new way. It's a pleasure, and, and, and thank you for having us. It's, it's, it's great talking with you. Congrats, guys. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you. You can find all episodes of the Mayo Clinic Ophthalmology Podcast on our website. Thank you for listening, and we definitely look forward to sharing more 